Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 484 of the podcast and it is Friday 10th of April 2020 as I record this at the end of the third week of lockdown here in the UK and it is a gorgeous, really super gorgeous uh, Easter weekend here and I will be making the most of my one government approved walk a day, (laughs) that's for sure, this weekend. So today I have an interview with Mark McGuinness, who's been on the show a number of times, and he also has a great podcast, The 21st Century Creative. Now, Mark is a good friend of mine. He used to be a psychotherapist and now works as a creative coach. Basically, I part interviewed him and partly got a free coaching session. (laughs) So lucky me and you get to listen in. And uh, this is kind of a special episode uh, that I've slotted in. And we talk about dealing with fear and uncertainty. Uncertainty is almost a much bigger thing for many of us, like what is going to happen. And also we talk about trusting emergence, how we can reset our expectations around creativity, as well as the important assets for a digital first business and what might change as a result of the pandemic. And as I said, Mark is a good friend of mine, so we, uh, we're always pretty open with each other. I also personally needed Mark's help because I put down my novel in progress Map of the Impossible on 6th of March, just when things really started to kick off in the UK. And then we went into lockdown and I've been going through the various stages of grief that we are all going through. And I've talked about that and I've been journaling a lot and I wrote a piece on the importance of home for my books and travel podcast. I've been working on nonfiction and online courses because we all need to protect protect our income streams online if we can. And all of those things. So I have been working, I've been working pretty hard, (laughs) but I have not managed to get back to my novel, which is what I was meant to be doing (laughs) in March and April. And in talking to Mark, and you will hear the moment of realisation in the interview, uh, I realised that I thought I had progressed through these stages of grief, of which denial is one of them. But turns out I was still in denial. (laughs) And I I almost think that we cycle backwards and forwards through these things every day almost. Um, But my usual routine, I guess I was still clinging to the idea that, oh, next week it will be fine and I'll be back in the cafe and I'll be writing and it will, I don't need to change my process because we'll be back to normal next week. (laughs) I laugh, but you know, we have to laugh or we would cry. But um, I realised as part of doing this interview that my usual routine is possibly disrupted for a long time because even when the lockdown starts to be lifted, and hopefully that's going to be in the next few weeks, um, it won't be everything and it won't be that everything's back to normal. It may be that we can't go back to cafes, restaurants, a lot of the places where we gather. And maybe my favourite independent cafe won't last. Um, Sadly, that's going to happen to a lot of these businesses. So for many years, I've been a morning writer, getting up, going to the cafe to do my first draft words, listen to rain and thunderstorms, get my coffee from the from the barista. And my home office has been for admin and podcasting and business stuff and accounting. And so I, I had these very two different places where I did my different types of work. But in talking to Mark, I realised I had to make a shift. So I set about making a new routine. And I'm telling you this before the interview because that's been my last week. We recorded the interview a week ago, so uh, this is what's happened this week. So it has worked. I want you to know that it's worked. Um, So the morning, uh, so the first day I wanted to write in the morning, but my husband and I um, go for a walk in the morning because uh, it gets quite busy later on, even though everyone's trying to social distance, people are having their walks. And so the earlier we go, the better. And uh, so the morning is for exercise. And then by the time we go for quite a long walk, by the time we get back, 
there's admin and stuff. So I've decided, right, instead of feeling guilty about walking in the morning, the morning is now for walking or exercise, doing my weights with my trainer, Dan, which I'm about to do after this, <laughs> really helps actually doing a bit of a bit of spike uh, endorphins twice a week. But uh, I felt guilty that first morning. I was like, oh, but I meant to write and now I'm out walking. And I'm like, stop it. Walking is walking with my husband is one of the amazing things in my life. You know, we are not sick and we can walk. So that is wonderful. Don't take that for granted. And so walking doing some admin, doing some work. And then in the afternoon, so basically before lunch, I close everything down on my laptop. So it's uh, the only thing that's open is Scrivener. And uh, so when I come back to my desk after lunch, I don't open anything else. So Scrivener is there and I've changed my music. So I've been listening to Rain and Thunderstorms for a decade. (laughs) Seriously, I've written decades worth of books listening to rain and thunderstorms but because it's so associated with my cafe and it was making me feel weird so I thought well new new place new music now I'm not really a music listener at all but I thought right I need some instrumental music so I have picked the Game of Thrones soundtrack Uh, I'm using Spotify and it has it's basically 10 hours of instrumental Game of Thrones music now I love Game of Thrones um, whatever you think about it the music is excellent (laughs) so yeah that's what I'm doing I am putting on my headphones putting on the soundtrack and I'm writing the change of sound has worked really well because I've never done that before. I've never used that music in any form before. And so I'm back into the novel, which is really awesome. And I've written uh, 8,000 words so far this week. And yeah, it actually feels really good to be back in control. But it's amazing that I needed that reboot and just totally changing my writing routine in order to get that back under my control. And it's definitely been out of control, (laughs) which is fine. But as I said, you know, it's been a month now, so I needed to get back into this. So I wanted to tell you about it and uh, kind of ask you, check in with yourself as we're going through the discussion with Mark in the interview today. And are you still in denial that things have actually changed and that this is not just a temporary uh, thing, that things are going to be quite different for a while? Obviously, at some point, there'll be a vaccine. Things will be fine, I'm sure. But uh, we need to think about how we're going to continue creating. How can you design a new routine? And how can you shift things around so that, um, yeah, you can just get out of whatever? I think I was, it wasn't a creative rut because it was working for me, but the rut was no longer serving my muse. And yeah, so I'm I'm feeling pretty happy that I've got back into the novel, Map of the Impossible. I've now broken 40,000 words, which is a really good number because I feel like I know what's happening. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> discovery writing. So much fun. So in publishing and book marketing news, obviously, uh, I'm I'm not going to talk about the bad news, the layoffs, the bookstore closures, etc. But I am going to share a piece that the new publishing standard just posted with statistics on the growing adoption of ebooks. Links in the show notes or go to thenewpublishingstandard.com, which is a really fantastic blog about global publishing. And uh, if you're wide, if you're interested in the global market, uh, it's it's really, really good. Um, so basically, it says it is estimated at least 50,000 readers in Spain have transitioned to, to digital reading, ebooks and audiobooks in the past three weeks. As lockdown in Spain keeps bookstores closed, people at home and makes online print delivery an unnecessary hazard for warehouse and delivery workers. Confinement is transforming the book discovery habits of thousands of readers, as well as their purchase and consumption on screens. The longer the pandemic crisis continues, the longer time for dedicated print readers to migrate to digital, even as print-based stakeholders like booksellers struggle to survive. Many will stay hybrid readers or even transition fully to digital afterwards. 
To be clear, there's no suggestion this will be an extinction event for print, but when this is over and when we return to whatever the new normal may be, digital books will play a far larger part in the lives of consumers and publishers than we could have ever imagined as this new decade began just a few short months ago. Now, I wanted to read that because I, this is really important for us as indies, we have skills and knowledge and we've made decisions about our publishing that actually mean that many indie authors are much safer, in inverted commas, in certainly book sales than many traditionally published authors because we are digital first. We're digital ebooks, digital audiobooks, and we are print on demand. That is our business model. And uh, especially if you are wide and you're available on every device in every country and every platform, including every library platform, this means that the future should be more positive for those of us who choose this route. And I wanted to read that because we all need some encouragement <laughs> right now. And this has certainly encouraged me. And it's funny because in the interview, I asked Mark what uh, that's coming up, what he wishes he had in place at this point. And he said, I wish I'd got my audiobooks done. So uh, that's pretty funny because <laughs> I've been kicking him about it for ages. Um, so there you go. Um, yeah, so have you transitioned your author business to digital first? And if you haven't, or if you're looking at your portfolio, which what projects could you do? How could you add more digital streams of income to your author business in order to protect it, not just for now, but for the future? And uh, I am going to be doing another mini course, uh, probably in May, because I want to finish this novel um, on your author business plan. That's going to be my next one, because I think that's important. Say thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments. Uh, thank you to Andrea Kamenka uh, or Kamencha this week says, I'm just loving your weekly updates. Even if the world is going crazy, I can still count on your effervescence and authenticity to bring me back to reality. Thank you, Andrea. Um, she says, I've been listening every week for 15 months. It's become my touch point. Uh, that makes me very happy. Thank you. Bethel Swift says, I've been in a personal publishing and day job slump the first half of this week. Grateful to the Creative Pen for being such a light and lifting my spirits. Thank you, Bethel. Connor Whiteley. Uh, thank you, Connor, for being such a a fan and Connor, Connor's been buying all my courses, which is just brilliant. And I much appreciate it. And Connor says, a great show. It was very inspiring. I'll be definitely be buying that course in a few weeks using using your link. Corporate sales will be great for my human branding book. Um, yes, David David's course is incredibly extensive uh, and very well priced, uh, I think. Uh, Heather Button says, just listened to the Wealthy Barber interview. It was so helpful, even with the little details like dedications. Finally, hello to new listener S.H. Alzar. He says, um, day one, I wrote a note about my sons. Day two, day three, and a, went, a week went by. Then the outbreak got worse and made me have to drive to work for social distancing. Then I found your podcast. I am your fan now. Thanks a lot. Um, so, Welcome, new listeners. <laughs> okay, so today's show is sponsored by Findaway Voices, which is one of the ways that you can transition more of your work to digital audio and create another valuable stream of income from your intellectual property. You can use Findaway Voices to get your books out into the largest network of audiobook sellers, including all the big ones like Audible, Apple Books, Kobo, Walmart, Storytel, Google Play, Script, all the others, and many more retailers, plus library apps, which more and more people will be using as the economy struggles in the months ahead. And also means we can make money from library borrows at the same time as offering free books to our readers and listeners. This is one of the killer ways to make money from free books. Uh, find a way can help you 
find the best way to produce your audiobook. You can narrate yourself or work with a narrator privately, then upload your audiobook for distribution and sale, which is how I use it. Or you can use their full service production model or use Voices Share, which is basically a royalty split deal. You do not have to be exclusive to any retailer like the other obvious player in the market. You can also control your price, which is fantastic. Uh, You can take part in promotions like Chirp Books run by BookBub, which you can only do if you're wide with audio because you have to be able to control your price. And find a way also do monthly promos with libraries and other retailers that you can submit your books to. I use Find A Way for all my wide audiobooks and as my audiobooks start coming out of royalty share deals on the other platform, I am moving them all wide very slowly. So I love Find A Way. I love the freedom to create and sell my audio to the world. So if you want to see the possibilities for your book projects, check it out at findawayvoices.com. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing of the show. But my time is sponsored by my wonderful patrons who I am more grateful to than ever as um, the economy (laughs) struggles. Uh, So thank you to everyone who is supporting the show and has supported the show for many years. Thanks to new patrons, Kate Craig. Hello, Kate. We've met. I remember. Uh, Helen O'Neill, Claire, Lars and Thea Lancashire. I really do appreciate the Patreon support. It demonstrates you enjoy the show and want it to continue. You can support the show with just a couple of dollars a month and you'll get the extra monthly Q&A audio, which I'll be recording in the next week or so, uh, including the backlist. So tons more audio fun. Uh, You can support the show at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Mark McGuinness is an award-winning poet, a non-fiction author, a creative coach, podcaster and international professional speaker. His books for authors include Resilience, Motivation for Creative People and 21 Insights for the 21st Century Creative. Mark spent many years as a practicing psychotherapist and now coaches creative professionals. So today we're talking about how we can deal with the coronavirus pandemic. Welcome back to the show, Mark. Thank you for inviting me back, Joe. It's, it's always nice to be here. Oh, indeed. And when I was thinking, uh, who can I talk to about this? I thought, I know, I'm going to ask Mark. <laughs> so I'm really, I'm really grateful that you're here. Now, we're both, just to sort of set the scene, um, we're recording this on the Friday, the 3rd of April, 2020. And uh, we're both in lockdown in the southwest of England. So I wonder, what does your household look like right now? Because you've got kids and, you know, family. So w- what does it look like? <laughs> Do you know, in a funny way, it's not all that different to usual. It's a bit like the Easter holidays have arrived earlier because my wife, Mammy, and I, we we always work from, well, nearly always work from home. So we're kind of used to doing this and juggling, having the children, you know, and, you know, somebody's on duty and somebody's off duty with the children when, when the other one's got meeting or a deadline. So I think we're quite lucky in that we're used to working this way. I mean, it's kind of weird when I look out the window, normally my car's the only one in the driveway in our little square. But now I look out the window, all my neighbours have had to adopt my lifestyle and they're not happy about it, I think. (laughs) Um, But so in one sense, nothing weirdly has changed for us. But in another sense, of course, the whole context has changed. And I've been spending a lot of time on calls, you know, sessions and extra calls with clients, helping them come to terms with this weird new world that we've got. And of course, trying to get my own head around it. So it's a very strange mixture for me. You know, externally, I haven't been disrupted all that much. But, you you know, in another way, it's been a really profound sense of disorientation. Yeah, I know what you mean. That sort of, when you say the context has changed, you're exactly right. And, you know, me and Jonathan are at home as well, like we would normally be, but I can't go to the writing cafe and you go outside and there's people wearing face masks and um, Mm. separation by two metres in the supermarket. And, uh, you know, you can't go see your friends. Like you and I meet in person for coffee and we don't we don't know when we'll be doing that again so it is a kind of strange situation and that's what i want to come to you first because as you said we're very lucky but i'm 
definitely feeling anxiety. My sleep is uh, disrupted. Um, I know many people are having much more anxiety than me. And also there is a rise in, in depression because a lot of people are not introverts like us. <laughs> they want to meet people and you yeah, know cuddle yeah. people and there is this fear about our own safety and those we love and also this existential fear about the state of the world which is just taken over the news cycle so i wondered if you could maybe talk about acknowledging those fears but also how to deal with them in a, in a healthy way yeah i think first of all the acknowledging is really important that it's okay to be afraid it's okay to be anxious or, you know, to be awake at three in the morning thinking, well, how's this all going to be playing out? Um, you know, let alone being concerned about um, relatives and loved ones. Um, and I think part part of, you know, when you acknowledge it, then you start to take back a bit of control for it. You, um, and there's different ways of doing this. You know, one is just simply being present and noticing this is this is how I'm feeling right now. This is why it's really hard for me to get into my writing uh, because I'm feeling X or Y. Um, sometimes writing about it can help or talking about it or if you have a meditation practice or some kind of focusing practice, that's a really good way of getting connected to your body, which is also connecting up to your emotions. Um so I think that, you know, that's that first step and, and acknowledging that we are all feeling this way. It's nothing, um, you know, if, if you're not feeling a bit anxious or a bit sad or depressed or lonely or whatever, then I would say that would be a problem at, at this point. It's, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's kind of, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not like, um, it, it depersonalizes it when you realize that. So I think that's the first thing you, acknowledge it and really get in touch. What am I feeling right now? And give yourself permission to feel that. And maybe that means that you're not going to be insanely productive today or this morning or, or whenever it is. Um, the other thing that I think is really important for all of us to have is some kind of restorative practice every day uh, or practices, you know, maybe more than one. So obvious things are stuff like meditation or exercise or prayer, or, um, I don't know, practicing a musical instrument or doing some, doing something creative, as long as that feels like you want what you want to be doing. Um, it could be connecting with a friend, you know, I know quite a few people are having a daily Skype chat with a friend in the evening as a way to, to finish the day. Um, and it's, it could be doing something like studying or practicing a musical instrument, but something that, that centers you and gives you energy and gives you a bit of calm and perspective in the middle of everything. And this applies, I was going to say, even I would say it applies, especially if you have responsibilities and things that you need to get done for, for work or for other people, because you know, it's the oxygen mask thing on right now. We all need to show up big time in our work and in our personal lives to be, you know, the best version of ourselves we can be for the, for our work and for the people who matter to us. Um, and it's the thing about you, you need to put your own oxygen mask on first. So if you, um, if you do something for yourself each day that, that helps you maintain that, then absolutely, you know, make that the bedrock of your day. Mm. I mean, I, I think we're very lucky here in the UK because we're we have been told at this point that we can go for like one walk a day to do yeah. exercise, and uh, we walk by the canal, and there's a lot of bird song and happy creatures at the moment because it's sunny and and it's spring, and it feels there are moments you know we're walking along and it doesn't feel like anything's changed. <laughs> Except that yeah. everyone's weaving around each other on the towpath so that we're, you know, two metres apart. But that um, bird song, I think, for me, is is what makes me happy, like can immediately um, make me smile. I haven't actually tried it just out on an app, um, <laughs> but I think going outside <laughs> in nature. <laughs> no, I definitely do go for the real thing in this Go for the real thing. Although, case. I mean, I know I realise some people listening might be in countries where you're not allowed to go for a walk. And it's it, that's I think that's the other thing. It's different everywhere at the moment. There are even some countries that aren't on lockdown or some states in the US that aren't on lockdown. And I think that's the other thing. Maybe you could address this. I feel like everyone's on a different 
level of understanding, both scientifically, like my husband um, did biochemistry. So on a scientific thing, he understands all this stuff that I don't understand as an art student, <laughs> and which makes me yeah. feel ignorant, um, not stupid, just ignorant about things that are beyond my understanding. And um, so that's, that's one level that we're all different on. And then also just being in different places in a sort of grief cycle, I guess, that anger and acceptance, um, denial, I think everyone's on this different place. Do you feel that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I have a lot of international clients, so it's very interesting to compare the view from, you know, the US or South America or Australia or, you know, different parts of Europe. Um, I'm, I'm really getting the barometer of, well, so are you allowed out of that room? <laughs> it's one of the, the first questions we ask each other. Um, and also we, my wife's family are in Japan and apparently that right now they're, they're being quite laissez-faire about it, the government. And we're, you know, saying to them, yeah, are you still going out and doing stuff? Because, I mean, really, you know, saying to, to family and friends over there, well, you know, you might want to be a little more cautious about that. So, yeah, def definitely I'm seeing a, a wide spectrum of, uh, let's say, experience around this. Mm. And I think the other thing that I'm struggling with is uncertainty. I, I'm definitely a type A personality. I like to have mm -hmm. my goals. I have the dates by which I'm doing things. Uh, and I was fine with, you know, cancelling travel plans for April, May, I kind of knew that that was happening uh, over six weeks ago. But now I feel now this uncertainty of, well, we don't know when we're going to be out of this lockdown we don't know when businesses will start coming back we don't know whether you know the cafe that we meet in will ever open again and this uncertainty i'm finding really hard because um yeah. i don't know i just feel like uh you know i'm ruminating on one potential scenario when and then and then i'm ruminating on a different scenario and sometimes it's catastrophic and sometimes it's hopelessly positive <laughs> Um, so what can we do about this uncertainty? Well, first thing to say there is me too. <laughs> I mean, I'm I, I'm the type A. I've always got a plan and a project and, and stuff that I want to get on with. And one of the disorienting things for me is realising that, you know, when you're mentally making plans and in your mind's eye, you picture it, it's almost like you put it on your mental whiteboard. Well, it's as though the whiteboard isn't there anymore. You know, it's, it's really hard to write on the air because it's just, well, we don't know what things are going to be like, even in a couple of months time. So I certainly feel the pain of that. Um, but the other thing that I've been thinking about specifically in relation to uncertainty is, you know, as writers, as creatives, this is actually something we're really good at because we live with it. Every time we sit down, we look at the blank screen it's more likely to be a screen than a page these days and it's our job to fill that with ideas with stories with with something that you know if we knew and this is the weird thing because if we knew what it was going to be in advance we wouldn't want to write it because it would be boring uh, except so it's, people who are plotters mark <laughs> Oh, apart from plot. But even then, you know, if you plot, but there's still the fun of colouring it in and there's unexpected stuff must happen along the way, right? Mm. <laughs> you're grudgingly giving me that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. I mean, when you're plotting, you have to make it up. So fair enough. <laughs> right. So at a certain point, no, this is what I want to say. This is a skill that we have as creatives, as writers. And normally it's something we're going towards because we want to make that write that story, make that book. Now we're having a, a bit of uncertainty, a lot more uncertainty thrust upon us. But I would say if you're listening to this and you're, you're feeling scared and overwhelmed by that, then go to this kind of ninja ability that you already have and see how much of it you can apply to the current situation, which things like, okay, I don't know what it will be right now, but I know I will discover it. I know I can improvise. I know I can figure it out as I go along. Um, do you remember that book Jonathan Fields wrote a few years ago called Uncertainty? Yes, he's been on the podcast, actually. I was thinking around it right. the other day. I can't seem yeah. to find it on my bookshelf, but I have to get it on Kindle Be again. <laughs> because he, and you know, he went around and he interviewed a load of artists, creatives, entrepreneurs about what was the common 
thread that they all had in common. And he said, you know, instead of some amazing creative thinking ability or productivity habit or, or whatever, the thing that he honed in on was they were all really good at tolerating uncertainty. Because if you're painting a picture or writing a book or starting a company, there's going to be a lot of time when you don't know if it's going to turn out. You don't know if it's going to satisfy you, let alone anyone else. You don't know if it's going to be a success. And most people run from that experience. This is why most people are not entrepreneurs or creatives or, or writers, because they want that certainty and security that that comes from that. But he said the long the more you can stay in that space of not knowing and this is where he's he's on the same page as John Keats, who says, you know, negative capability is the key to creativity. When you you, you don't know, you 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 don't come to con conclusions. Um, the more chance you have of creating something amazing, because you're the longer you're going to stay with the problem itself. Uh, so I would in encourage you to just accept. I don't know right now. And stay in that space and draw on that that ninja power of, well, the longer I stay in, the more chance I have to stay awake and figure it out. Mm. Nick, everybody listening, get your ninja powers on, <laughs> which is great. But it's funny you say that because I do actually have on my wall, I have all these sayings, but I have one that says trust emergence. And that's kind of what we have to do. We have to trust that something will emerge. Well, something will emerge from this and we'll come to the future in a minute. But trusting emergence is also within ourselves that we will deal with whatever comes up. And I think almost what I'm struggling with is the slowing down of pace in a way, yeah, because we, yeah. you know, we're used to. Well, the only thing that's not slowed down is the pace of the news, obviously, which is just crazy. But everything else, like it's so quiet on a weekday, you know, traffic slow, people walking more, and just this that that's weird because it's adjusted the energy of what we can achieve, and. I'm finding also, like you mentioned productivity habits and you are not, you've been on the show, you've talked to, we've both got books on productivity and yeah. both, both of us yeah. recommend a physical place and a time where you can yeah. get into your creative flow if possible. And that's been my issue. My creative place for fiction is this specific desk in a specific cafe. <laughs> and now I'm having <laughs> problems because I don't have that space in that cafe and I can't right. seem yeah. to get down into the deeper part of my brain where I write fiction. So I am creating, I'm doing lots of nonfiction, but I'm in the middle of a novel and I just can't get back to it. So what are your tips for those people who are also struggling with creation at, at this point? Well, I think maybe the first question is, is to ask, do you really need and or want to create right now? Because there is a, you know, there are some days it maybe it films too intense, too overwhelming that you say, well, you know what, I'm going to give myself a break today. I'm going to read something instead of writing something. Um, but if you're saying, yes, I absolutely do. I want to, uh, you know, it, and it would be good for me to get into the writing zone. Then I would say, set aside some time. Don't try and do this all day, particularly if you're struggling and, and let people around you know what you're doing. So you're not going to get interrupted. And then the thing that can open the portal to creativity again is ritual. So, and because it, when you go through the same steps as you, you do with your creative ritual, like for instance, going to the cafe, you walk to the cafe, probably you have the warm up thoughts on the way there. You get there, you, you know, chat with the barista, you order your usual, you, you sit in your favorite seat. All of this is, primed in your unconscious mind, it's saying, okay, so we're going to be writing fiction in a minute. Now, one thing you could do, Joe, is just sit there and visualize all of that and just take five, 10 minutes to really think yourself through it, brew yourself some coffee, you know, anything that's going to have the same kind of scent or sounds. I don't know if maybe your app has cafe background it music. Does. There it. Is a, it there does. There is a cafe okay, app. Well, yeah. Well, of course it does. <laughs> maybe just take some time. I mean, it might feel, feel a bit weird, but nobody's looking. Um, and visualize all of that. And it can be surprising how 
powerful that can be. Um, the other way into it, of course, is to start making up a new ritual, say, well, okay, so this part of the living room table or, or my desk or, or whatever, or this arrangement of stuff on the desk, this is going to be my new signal. Um, music, I find really good for this. Um, it, some kind of scent is good, whether it's it's coffee or it's incense or it's a candle. So that what you're trying to do is give yourself – now, when I used to be a hypnotherapist, and one of the ways I was trained to create a trigger for an emotional state, which is – this is what it is, is it's got to be something unique that you associate with that state. So, for instance, when I write in the mornings, I drink out of my special coffee cup, which is a Japanese teacup that has got – it's got all the little Star Wars characters on the side. It's a traditional <laughs> cup. And it's got all this, all their names in Japanese characters, which is hilarious. And I only ever drink coffee from that cup. And I only ever drink it in the morning. And nine times out of ten, that means I'm writing. So that is a part of my trigger for the writing state. So whether your ritual has been dis you know, if, if you have a usual ritual, then keep using it. And if you're prevented from that, then come up with a new one or visualize the old one and just, just make, but deliberately make it part of, I'm going to journey to get into this state of mind and give yourself a bit of time to do that. So, I mean, the other day I recorded a Thomas Hardy poem to send to my list with some thoughts about that and coronavirus. Um, and I did my voice warm up which i got from my teacher Kristen linklater and it's a recording and it's it's an hour long recording of voice exercises and by the time i've done that i'm in a very different state to before i started so you don't necessarily have to take an hour it can be as as little as five or ten minutes but doing something consciously and deliberately to alter your state beforehand it gives you the best chance of of getting into that zone Mm. And I realised when you were talking what the problem is, um, which is why, oh, yeah. you know, you're a psychotherapist and <laughs> coach and everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I've realised you said make a new ritual and I've written down I'm in denial. I'm in denial yeah. that I need a new ritual because I'm still hopeful that I'll be back at the cafe next week. Right. I think that's right. what it, I think that's what it is. I think okay. you know as you and I speak we're heading we're in week 2 of what we were told is a 3 week lockdown and I think in my like my logical brain knows that this is going to go on much longer. It's not going to be 3 weeks. It's yeah. not going to be like oh in a week and 2 days time yeah. I'll be back no. at the cafe. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's not happening but I think as you were talking I was like why why am I resisting because I know, yeah, I know this. I know you. Know, you know, I know this, and yet I've been resisting making a new routine and a new ritual. And I think that's why I think I'm just holding on to the hope that this will pass quickly, and I'll be back into it. So, I guess the next question is: Do I do I just have to get over that? Now I realise that. Do I get over it or do I say, okay, well then, all right, creative child, Joe, um, you can have another week and then at three weeks, then you must start or something like a deadline or I don't, that's a type A thing, isn't it? <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah, maybe we could take some of the must out of it. Oh, but I, um, I, I think I do okay with must. I mean, this, this is oh, my okay. therapy session now. Not Nobody's right. listening. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. I'm glad there's no one else listening. <laughs> Um, but I mean, does it have to, okay, I'm, I'm curious, does it have to mean that, you know, if you have a new ritual now, does it mean that the old one's never coming back? Could this not be your new portable one that you could take on holiday, for instance? Yeah, I mean, I, I probably wouldn't take it on holiday, but I, I do need an in the house option mm. and something that I think maybe even just realising that this is the problem has probably helped. Mm -hmm. And maybe people listening, maybe yeah. that is true for other people listening. Because if you're in denial that things have truly changed, then perhaps, you know, that is true of a number of different things. 
Um, for ex- another another great example being how much junk food um, we're we're eating at the moment, and um, quite a lot of my friends have said, "Yeah, we're eating so much junk food and drinking wine every night, and you know, people doing things that they normally would do well, on weekends." All that, all that stuff at the back of the cupboard that's left over from Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely don't have any of that, but but um, you know, that it's behaviour that you allow yourself because you think, "Oh, it'll, it'll be over quite quickly." And this is sort of comfort yeah. behavior because we'll be out of it soon. But, you know, 10 kilos later. <laughs> <laughs> so, OK, so I think that's helped me. I think people listening make that new ritual and recognize or uh, question whether or not you're in denial as um, as I have definitely been. Um, OK, so anything else on that uh, emotional side before we get into the business stuff? Around writing specifically, or anything, anything else you all well, okay. Your here's here's are all right. So here's another thing that I'm using a lot with clients and and remembering to use myself is Stephen Covey's circles of influence and concern. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I'd like you, to, listener, to imagine a big circle, right? And in this circle is everything that affects you. And the people that you care about in your life it includes the economy, it includes the weather, the environment. It includes what other people are up to. It includes, I don't know, your sports team. And of course, it includes coronavirus and all the stream of news and information that's coming at us about that. Now, we need to be aware of this because by definition, it it's a circle of concern. It affects us. But Now I want you to imagine inside of that, there's a smaller circle. So it looks like a fried egg. And Covey points out, this is in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Mm. He says, the circle of influence will always be the smaller circle. In other words, there's always more stuff happening in your life that affects you than vice versa. But Here's how we use it, because the more time and attention you give to that big circle, the more anxious and disempowered and frustrated and overwhelmed you will feel. And also the smaller the inner circle gets because you're not taking action on it. Now, we need to be aware of it. I mean, you know, for instance, if you're not looking at at the news once a day, then you're probably not fulfilling your civic duty right now, let, let alone, mm. you know, keeping yourself safe and working out, you know, have the alien overlords landed yet. Um, but I would say definitely ration that and ration social media because th- there's so much anxiety coming at you from that. And beyond a certain point, you've got the information and you're just mainlining anxiety. Covey encourages us to focus on the small circle, the circle of influence, and ask, okay, what is in my small circle right now? What can I actually do that's going to make a positive difference? So stuff to take care of yourself, I talked about, you know, the restorative practice, stuff to take care of your family, uh, people you care about, uh, stuff that will take care of your work and your business. And the idea is that the more time you spend in this circle of influence, the more empowered you feel. And in fact, the more empowered you are because you're doing stuff that makes a difference. So that small circle can get quite a bit bigger. You can have a a fried egg with a really big yolk in it um, relative to the other one. So I would say definitely, you know, keep that image in mind, sketch it on a post-it and stick it up above your desk and keep asking yourself, particularly when you feel overwhelmed, say, well, what is in my small circle here? If if there's nothing, it's just a news item you're worrying about, then distract yourself from it. Go and do something else. But ideally, you want to find something, okay, I can go and do that right now. And then I will feel that I'm making the difference that I can. Mm, yes, controlling those small things. Uh, cleaning helps. <laughs> cleaning is great. My lawn is absolutely looking terrific the car (laughs) is cleaner than it's ever been and the the other thing is the kids aren't getting in it and filling it with mud so i can i can you know with pride i'll know that it'll be like that for at least a few more days 
So <laughs> that's, that's great. Um, okay, so let's talk about business because um, you know you and I meet up now and then, and we talk about creative business, and we both are very keen on the business side as well as the creative side, and um, you know practicing our craft, but also we like making money. And what's really interesting is that a lot of people right now are triaging their business and realizing that perhaps they didn't have everything in place for this fully online world. Um, so I wanted to, you know, with your perspective of your clients and what you what you have talked about um, on your podcast, um, 21st Century Creative, what are the most important business assets to have in place in this type of world? And what, what are the most resilient creative businesses doing right now? Well, this is a, uh, you know, I, I really like you, I'm very much on board with the idea of creating assets. Um, so one of my mottos is forget the career ladder. There's no career ladder for people like us. Start creating assets. And by assets, I mean the kind of, you know, I mean, there's the whole category of financial assets, which we're familiar with, and I'm not in a position to advise on. But if you're creative, then your biggest asset is you. So right now, any work that you have done on personal development, on self-awareness, on motivation, resilience, creativity, anything that makes you more skilled, more experienced, this is payback time, you know, because the degree to which you can operate within that circle of influence and and how big it can get really depends on, on how much you've invested in yourself emotionally and otherwise in order to to be a resilient, independent creative, which I know your listeners are. So uh, uh, other categories of assets are things like your, uh, your catalog of books and the intellectual property in those. And again, I know, Joe, you're really hot on this, that you have one book, but it can be several products. It can be licensed and repurposed and uh, uh, available in different editions and different languages and so on. You also have what I call social assets, so your network, your audience, your readership, the community that you're a part of, um, and then more kind of nuts and bolts. Um, so you could classify as digital assets, things like your website, your mailing list, your social media, and kind of encompassing all of that really is your your author brand, your reputation, the fact that, you know, if you've been working for X amount of time and you've got a certain number of books out of a of a certain standard, then people know your name and they know your work. And th these are the creatives who are going to be the most resilient in a crisis because they've already got multiple streams of income, as you talk about, and they're attracting uh new readers, new opportunities, new sources of income to them. So I would say the, what maybe one of the first things to do right now is do an audit of the different types of asset you have. You know, start with yourself, then think about the social assets, think about your work and the various products and intellectual property in that, and then look at, you know, say digital presence uh, beyond that. And then ask yourself, well, where is the value here that I could unlock right now? What, what are some things I could do that would bring me a bit more security and stability right as I am? And then following on from that, where am I weak? Where, where could I have stronger assets or more assets? And what would it be really good for me to start prioritizing creating for the future? Mm. And it's, it's you know, I, obviously I, I know how you see it and I think it's so uh, valuable to think about assets in all these different ways. And, you know, perhaps sometimes I'm too reductive on what I consider an asset. But when this happened, you know, when this really hit me a couple of weeks ago, I did this sort of audit uh, on my business. And, you know, I already have a pretty resilient business. But the one thing I... um Re realized in that moment it was so funny because i know this we all know this so we get paid 30 to 60 days after the sale right or with the yeah. big, with the stores like yeah. amazon and all of that and many authors don't get paid for months or even years for their work through traditional publishing but we as indies we get paid you know 30 to 60 days after and i suddenly realized that that is 
my, that cash flow is out of my control. So even if I release a book today, if I write something really fast and release a book today, it's going to be a month or so before I get any money. And that moment made me double down on direct sales. And, you know, we've talked about this before, but what I did is I put out, um, I put everything that I had not put up for direct sale on payhip.com. <laughs> and then I sent an email out to my list and with a coupon and sold you know, really decent amount of books. And that money went into my bank account that day. And that process was exactly what you're talking about. It was going, what are my assets? I have these books, I have an email list, and I have some online tools. How can I make money right now? So it was so funny, because I thought that I had, I thought I could control everything really in my digital space. And then I realized this cash flow thing, but there was a fix. Uh, so, you know, we can all improve something, can't we? And that's a great example. And I'm the world's worst at this by nature of just going for what would be a really quick and easy way for me to create some money right now that doesn't have to be really hard work and take months or even years of effort before it, it bears fruit. So, Maybe that's a really good question to ask. You know, what what would be an easy way or a quick way for me to generate some more money or opportunity this week? Yeah, and in fact, the service model. Um, I mean, you're a, a creative coach, and you've you've got a lot of established clients. Um, but the service model is often a very good way to make money quickly. Um, you know, what can I offer? and be paid by the hour to do. Um, and I've even thought about doing consulting at this point or other things where I could offer my knowledge in exchange, um, you know, for an hourly rate. So if people listening, I mean, that's one, one possibility. Um, but then, as you say, I realised I had all these assets and uh, in terms of books that I could sell direct. And what's so brilliant about selling direct is I get the money back in my pocket. And then the second thing is what can we build for next time? so that we don't have to scramble because we have a plan. And what I, the decision I've now made out of that experience, um, you know, of getting money within minutes <laughs> from book sales, which I'm just not used to doing, um, is that I will now, from now on, I'm going to launch with the direct sale first because I don't really care about you know, hitting lists anymore. Um, you know, I want people to be able to buy my books anywhere, but I also want that money in my pocket. So that's actually a business change I'm going to make based on this this uh, new process. So, oh, sorry, the thought's gone now. Um, that's all right. Um, so in, I guess in saying that, um, people listening and all of us can be thinking, what can we do? Because you, you know, you mentioned that you are the asset, you are the best asset. So even if you haven't got things in place right now, so for example, um, I, I also want to build up my email list more because the email list to me is one of the best assets you can have. Um, and then if you, if you have products, whatever you have, you can sell them through your email list. So the email list is a big asset. What can we build for next time? Because there will always be a next time. You know, I started my business in the global financial crisis um, and I built it this way because I wanted it to be resilient in a financial crisis. And, you know, things are okay financially, but what could I do even better? So I think that's the next question, isn't it? Like, if we haven't got those things in place, what can we do to build them? Yeah, maybe a good question to start here is, what do I really wish I had right now that I haven't? Yeah. Or, what, you know, <laughs> what do I wish I'd started two years ago? Well, it's two years, you know, into the future. You'll be glad you started it now. Yeah, indeed. So have you um, thought about anything that you, you know, would like to have in place for next time? <laughs> well, you know, I, on my to-do list, I keep, uh, and I know you keep telling me to record my books as audio books mm. to get all the um, editions out. So I did, I've still got one book I haven't even done the print edition of yet, uh, which is ridiculous. So, yeah, there's stuff like that that, again, it, it falls into the category that feels a bit easy. You know, that's not creating something new from scratch. But actually, this is, is one thing. If I get the, you know, the print edition done, I get the audio books done, I just, just get all of that laid out in a row because then whatever promotion you do, you're going to see, a, you know, you, you're promoting it all at once, so to speak. You know, each time you promote just one format of a book, 
you leave out the people who go, oh, I wish you'd done the audio book. Yeah, exactly. And it's so interesting because, of course, right now, as we speak again, the news uh, is that um, in the UK, a lot of the um, uh, gardeners and Bertrams and the print bookstores, a lot of them are closed. Who would have known that, you know, in this situation, we just wouldn't have a- have access to a lot of print books. Amazon are uh, shipping books slowly. They, you know, shut down briefly doing book delivery, but that's apparently back now. But having the digital ebook and the digital audio book in a time where physical shipping is under challenge, uh, you know, that, that has got to be a reason to kick you a bit so that you get that book done. <laughs> Yes, once again. <laughs> once Thank again. you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> lecture, lecture almost over. So, look, let's think about the future because one thing is for certain, and I'm just, it's amazing what's happening in terms of the incredible scientists from every single country in the world are working on how to get us out of this, <laughs> both health wise yeah. and economically. So, we, we know that this too shall pass. What, what we don't know is when but it's got let's say within six months to a year we'll be in a different world um whatever that may may look like but for for sure things are going to change so have you have you thought of what you think might change as a result of this particularly for creatives and authors it would be nice to think that we are already ahead of the curve on this. I mean, you know, the weird thing is, you know, as soon as I read about um, social distancing and self-isolation, I thought, that's my life. (laughs) (laughs) I'm I'm already doing, I've already worked from home. I don't commute. I'm already using virtual meetings because it means I can work with clients all over the world. And it also means I get, instead of commuting, I'm spending the time writing or with my family. So I think one, th- I mean, it's tremendously disruption for a lot of people, but it would be nice to think that there would be a more broader reevaluation of working habits where independent, the ability to work independently and creatively and virtually, it's not, it's, it's not nice if it's the only option you've got and you don't like it, but I think hopefully it would give people more freedom and make them more alive to opportunities that could come in the digital space as well. And I think as creatives, you know, we're, we're, you know, know, most of your listeners, I would imagine, spend a lot of time on their own, working away, they're self-motivated, they're entrepreneurial. And if that is, you know, we're moving into a a world where that is kind of accepted more, and there's more opportunity there, then it would be nice to think we're well positioned for that. And it's funny you say that. I hadn't really thought about it that way. I, I guess I agree. And we're already doing all of this. And those of us who've had online businesses for like a decade, <laughs> like us, mm-hmm. um, you know, we have been doing this for for that long. What I was thinking is that it will bring a new wave of technology. You know, you and I, I know there are other options, but you and I are speaking on Skype as we have done for a decade. And mm-hmm. Skype, Skype is still, it's fantastic. But what I was... What I think might happen, especially with potential, um, you know, summits and conferences, is that a lot of those are going online with things like Zoom. But what if we get the virtual reality stuff accelerating because of Oh, that would be great. And and actually, this is, you know, as a coach, this is something I would really value. Because when I'm in a room with a client, I, I do like to use the room. I like to, you know, we can get up, we can move about, we can do all kinds of imaginative exercises or use the space and, and make things and and it's it's hard to do that obviously with a two-dimensional screen so any kind of vr that would allow me to interact with other people in a virtual space um purely as a coach i, I would absolutely welcome that and i can absolutely see the the benefit for something like a virtual conference or meetup or i don't know mastermind group or, or whatever yeah. And even things like this, you know, you and I could have a conversation in a VR space that other people can join and, you know, be part of live, for example, instead of doing a webinar on go to webinar, you do it in a oh, VR space. I mean, that would be so good because I really find webinars in particular challenging because to me, they've got most of the downside of a live event, i.e. the stress and something could go wrong without the upside because you, you <laughs> it's very hard to get that 
immediate connection with the audience, which to me is the joy of, of speaking with, you know, to an audience is being in the same room and, and, and having that almost like a visceral connection between you. So anything like that would, would be absolutely wonderful. Yeah. And of course, you and I both speak um, professionally and, you know, we have traveled a lot speaking and there's often things I will turn down because I'm like, yeah, there's no way I'm flying that far for that m- amount of money, you know, mm. it won't be that high, for example, or, you know, but I'd love to speak to that group. I'm just not going to get on a plane to do it. And yeah. so I'm really hoping that this will accelerate the technologies that have, because the market's been so small for that type of thing, it's been a small number of niches, I guess. But if this becomes a massive niche, it's going to be, uh, there'll be more money in it and we'll just see an avalanche of of tools, right? Well, if Prince Charles can open the new hospital in London today via Zoom, then hopefully the rest of us will (laughs) will be able to command similar uh, attention when we show up virtually. Oh, that's brilliant. I had no idea he was doing that, but that's excellent. Um, <laughs> I don't I, know if he got a pair of scissors and cut a tape. Or, virtual or scissors. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there is something else, and it was funny. Uh, we were standing in um, the supermarket queue, the very long supermarket queue with all the spacing, mm-hmm. and we were talking about the future, and um, and then we said something to Siri, and I, we realised that voice technology, which I've obviously been talking about for a while, voice technology is going to also um, grow because we've been used, everyone's been going with touch screens, but touch screens are suddenly going to be no no. It's going to be oh, yeah. it's going to yeah. be voice. So instead of t- you know touching screens, it's going to be voice enabled. So I actually think the voice technology stuff, which uh, what is already moving fast may accelerate past touchscreens. Yeah, I've been, even before the lockdown came along, I was so grateful for contactless payments. Oh yes. Using the Apple watch to pay. (laughs) Or even just, you know, a a card for contactless. And every time it was like, they had an old machine and you had to type in your pin. I was like, Oh my God, I need to, I need to disinfect my finger after that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so I think that's something that's um, possibly going to be interesting as well. Uh, and then, of course, I think that a lot, well, I hope, I hope that a lot of traditionally published authors and people who are locked in to um, places where they have less control of their money and their creativity, that perhaps they will start creating in other ways. Because I know a lot of authors whose contracts are being cancelled or just their books won't be published or they're launching, they have to launch and they've got no choice and there's no bookstore for them to launch into. And, you know, maybe they haven't got an audio book, like you said. So the disempowerment that many authors might feel over this period I hope, will change into that ownership of what is possible. That would be great, wouldn't it? It would be. Do you think that's going to happen? <laughs> well, I think it's there for the taking if if you really want it, if you set your mind to it and you say, okay, I want to take control of my career, my earning power, my reputation, my um means of production and distribution, then, it, you know, there's there's more and more tools and opportunities available. And I, I've always been an advocate for that. And I know you are too, Joe. It's um, the, at a certain point, you become the one who's holding yourself back, you know, unless you're locked into a really um, draconian contract. I mean, that's that would be the only alternative. Yeah, I think that's that is a good message to end on. Only you are holding yourself back, people. <laughs> and we hope that as But no judgment. This, no judgment. No, I've been holding myself back and now I'm just going to go out and do everything (laughs) or maybe just have a rest. (laughs) Um, But no, this has been great, Mark. Um, Tell people where they can find you and your podcast and your books and everything you do online. Okay, so the podcast is on obviously on iTunes. It's called The 21st Century Creative. It's where I interview inspiring and enterprising creators in all kinds of different fields. There's some writers, but also artists, designers, performers, um, singers, musicians, and so on, um, including some great interviews with Joe about the successful creative mindset and how to be a healthy creative. So that's the 21st Century Creative podcast 
And then my website is lateralaction.com. And you can find my books there, my blog, the podcast archive, and also my coaching services based there as well. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Mark. That was great. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, Joan. So I hope you found the discussion with Mark interesting and your challenge for today is to identify whether you're still in denial about any form of your creative process and whether you need to redesign your writing routine to adjust to the new situation. Next week, I'll be talking to Gail Carragher about building an author brand and how that resonates through your writing, your website, your book covers and even what you wear at conventions, if we ever have them again. (laughs) which of course we will. Just a joke. (laughs) So Gail is brilliant and we recorded the interview pre-COVID. So we are super upbeat and happy, which will all be refreshing. So stay safe and stay sane. Happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time. <laughs>